Absolutely. And we are, as far as everything is concerned. There's, I can see that we're um, actually speaking live to folk. Hello, everybody. Hello, oh, everybody. So Long time no see. see you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness gracious me. It always it warms the cockles of the heart to think of uh, folk actually waiting in the chat for us to, to pop up uh, like this. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, good yeah. to see you all. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, yeah, Secular Cat, Stuart, Grant, good evening, Brian, Daniel. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, damn. How do you pronounce? Uh, oh. Goch. Sorry, put me right. Shout at me. What? Yes, for pronouncing yes, a name or whatever the completely yes. wrong. <laughs> Hi there, Helen. Hi, Kate. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, time and Tide, good evening. Alison, Steve, uh, Arnman. Um, I don't recognize the name from Michigan. You're very welcome indeed. Simon, I know, faces in the stone. Hi, friends. Yeah, and you uh, missed Ro Hello, Helen. Roxy, welcome to your first time to watch a live when it's actually live. Well done. Well, welcome, well done. <laughs> uh, John, uh, Carrie Ann, Teresa. Um, yeah, I mean, a few names that I don't recognise. Maybe that's just me and, uh, and memory failing. Um, but oh, we, uh, we've got Ella Moxie. You're, you're very welcome indeed um, and I uh, hope you don't mind this is just a, a five minute countdown to uh, allow people uh, time to yes. gather and settle in before we show, uh, begin the show proper Hello so everybody, it's nice to see you us. Sibylla, hope you're, hope you're well and keeping warm Indeed yeah. Yay mm. um, uh, Marianne Hat <laughs> uh, pink hand waving uh, Kate, hello there. Uh, new fan, looking forward to her first live. You're very welcome, Kate. Yeah, fantastic. Um, oh, thank you. That's uh, very reassuring. I, I, I was uh, uh, accept to be close to proper pronunciation. Of, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good job I didn't do it then. Um, yeah. uh, I, th I think the lesson was learnt during Standing with Stones about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> being careful about pronunciations. Yes, Idiosyncrasy. Uh, watch out, uh, you're very welcome. Oh, <clears throat> oh and watcher well, just... <laughs> is very welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, we'll be telling you, uh, you know, what's up in tonight's show in, in, a, in a moment. Um, you know, we... Your uh, video seems to have cleared up as well, uh, Rupert. So. Which is a good job. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's not mm. something that I'm going to bang on about because you all know that I live in the middle of nowhere and often have bandwidth problems. But when uh, Mike and I, bef before we uh, do these live broadcasts, Mike and, I, uh, Mike and I are always having a bit of a chat for a while beforehand. And I was just pixelated fog. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> an improvement, some of you might say, but um, but no. Well, it's, that's, uh, well that describes the, the state of my brain earlier, the sort of pixelated fog. So hopefully it's uh, cleared up a bit, uh, and uh, we can actually speak words uh, tonight. Uh, cheers, folk. Um, this is an actually an alcohol-free uh, can of something. So hope you don't mind. Cheers. Yes, and uh, and cheers. This is actually nearly empty it's been on my desk for an hour and a half uh it's not alcohol free um but um, <laughs> but that uh, one is pixelated fog do you think that should be the name of our band <laughs> we have uh mitahati one to idea. thank for that idea yes because <laughs> you know rupert is a drummer and uh, what's that um behind me up in the corner a rarely played guitar that's what that is <laughs> don't have the time yeah yeah we keep talking about it we <clears> we <throat> should uh we should i mean <laughs> guys who do megaliths how, how could we not have a rock band at some point yeah um yeah. and the truth is that we have amongst our community we have a ridiculous amount run out of, of time
Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome. Uh, you're watching uh, Prehistory Guys Unplugged. I'm Michael Bott, and he's... And I'm Rupert Sosk. Uh There you are. The name yes. is on the screen. Yes, otherwise known as Rupert Fuzzy Soskin. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Being down Never in the south day. of France. Anyway, we're, uh, enough of uh, those excuses. We'll just have to have to bear with. Um, as long as we can mm. hear what you're saying, it'll be absolutely fine. And so, uh, welcome. Yeah, if you've not joined us before, um, prehistory guys, what are we up to? Well, you'll see that the the channel is full of stuff, quite eclectic in its sort of in its way. It's like running a a channel with uh, with several different strands. You know, we do films, we do specials, we do interviews. We've done, uh, you know, uh, we do these lives, um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, uh, lots more besides. I hope you have time to scour the rest of the uh, channel if you've not done so before. Um, yeah, so this has been going, what, about? We've been doing this about four years now, and we're so grateful. We've just gone past the 70,000 subscriber mark. And uh, talking of which, if you're watching and you haven't already subscribed, it would be great if you would hit the subscribe and, and like button. Uh, you know it mm. all helps. Um, Rupa, I don't want to throw a googly at you, but do you want to tell Go folk about... While, you know, no, actually, before we do that, I just want a, a bit of a heads up as where as to where we're taking you tonight. The Unplugged is about getting random bits of news from all over the place, yeah. uh, making you aware of them and, uh, and, you know, and having a general chat about them. So please, you know, do ask questions in the chat, uh, give your opinions in the chat, all that kind of thing. We'd love to respond to that if we manage to spot them before they disappear up the timeline. So Indeed, tonight we do we've got news from the N25 around uh, around London. Uh, we've got um, uh, we've got a cemetery, or not, inside the <laughs> uh, Arctic Circle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've yeah. Um, we've got a Neolithic uh, a Neolithic shipwreck, or not, <laughs> in the Mediterranean, and we've got yeah. a pyramid, or not, in yeah. Indonesia and uh, much more beside. Also, got a special treat for you because those in the know will know we've not long come back from uh, Gebekli Tepe. We'll speak more about that later, but we've got a special thing for you later on a special, uh, short um, but sweet, a special report from uh, Gebekli Tepe. And it's Gebekli Tepe probably as you've never seen it before. So please do stick mm. around uh, for that. We'll show you that later. In the meantime, Rupert, yeah. would you say a few words about our Patreon supporters, how great they are, and um, what you can do to join them? I will. I will. And some of them are here. Uh, hello, folks. Yeah, many of them uh, are here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in fact, it's the, it's the Patreon crew. We have a Patreon page, pre guys, uh, on Patreon. And... There's an awful lot of stuff on there that we produce just for our patrons. Basically, uh, our Patreon subscribers, they pay our wages. They enable us to do what we do here. Um, makes a huge difference to us. Um, they get a, a, a weekly podcast themselves and, uh, and various other odds and sods that uh, we produce along the way plus extended versions of, uh, of some of the other programs that we've created. Uh, it's, if you like what we do and, uh, uh, and you'd like to join that crew, you know, you, uh, it's, a, it's a buzzing community in there. And we have a, a monthly Zoom as well where you can come into the Zoom and we, just, uh, we all have a chat. You can ask us whatever you want, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, you can subscribe for um, just you know a few dollars up to more than a few dollars, um, but it's still wonderful value for money. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and and yes. uh, please now, uh, one or two of, uh, of you patrons uh, who are actually watching, please back me up on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, that's what, what the uh, patrons get all out of it. I mean, we get so much out of it because they hold our, you know, feet yeah. to the fire from time to time, and uh, 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 and as such a contribution and uh, encouragement and just keep us going. Um, they're absolutely brilliant. It is, yeah. Pounds will do. They convert it for you. <laughs> 
um, yes, Kate's everything else just said. Love the Zoom, so much fun. It's it's true. It's it, and the other thing is, of course, that it's not that often that you get an opportunity for us. I mean, it's not not it's not often that we get an opportunity to actually put faces to names and chat with people who are, you know, and chat with uh, people who are supporting what we do. You know, so it's it's great. It's very much a two way street and good fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, have indeed. I missed anything out? No, as I say, links in the description below. Oh, Enough look, of- Susan, hello, hello, Susan. Uh, Susan said, we get a ton out of the Patreon page. These guys and their followers are the best. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Um, Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah. and Sibylla has as well. Um, yeah, it's true. It's true. We do have a lot of fun. Um, mm. So unless we've got anything else to spill at the moment, um, I think it's less about us and more about um, news from prehistory. More about news that from around the world. Oxymoron, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll speak a bit more about uh, goings-on at Gebekli Tepe and uh, our visit there uh, a bit later yes. on. Um, but at the, for the moment, I think it's time to move on to the first item. And as promised, uh, taking you uh, to the M25. For those that don't know, yeah. the M25 is the circular motorway that goes all around the periphery of uh, uh, of London. So uh, it's it's rare these days that a, a news item takes us to our home territory. We've been... We tend to I uh, think has yeah. taken us east a, a lot recently, but no, this is home home ground and uh, the discovery of historical artifacts under excavations. So, uh, historical artifacts from thousands of years ago have been unearthed during construction work on the M25. The remains of a late Bronze Age, early Iron Age settlement have been uncovered by archaeologists during long-running building works. So motorists using the intersection between the M25 and A3, so that's uh, just about 15 to 18 miles directly southeast of the centre of, uh, you know, of central London, I'd say, just to yeah, roughly give it a yeah. bit. Of, yeah, um, at least five roundhouses have been discovered, um, giving archaeologists a new picture of what life used to be like in the area. The significance of this find is partly shown by the physical size of some of the structures, the largest of which has a diameter of 10 metres. The remains could date back as far as 1000 BCE, making them about the same age as the Phoenician alphabet. It's an interesting sort of chronological yes, correlation to make. Yeah. Mind you, they, they I can't think of a better one for something if you're going to yeah, <laughs> pin it on, uh, yeah. on something that people might know about. Uh, this particular find was discovered near Paynes Hill to the east of the construction site, and each of the structures are defined by ring ditches that surround the roundhouses overlapping with each other. Archaeologists say this shows the longevity of the settlement. So, Rupert, um, the size and uh, ring ditches, you, you, a few words uh, bearing reference to this uh, artist's impression. Indeed, uh, it's it's a very nice artist's impression as well. Um, the the nice thing about this is that uh, ring ditches, uh, you know, so often uh, these all sorts of uh, of prehistoric sites have been labelled as ritual in one way or another, and uh, and so to have an artist's impression that shows where they've found that, that these roundhouses were actually within ring ditches. And so mm-hmm. this is just a way of, uh, of it, it could have been anything as simple as keeping the pigs out of your house to... Um, or in. Uh, like, <laughs> or in, yeah, a little bit snug maybe. But then, yeah, why not? Why not? They did live with their animals half the time. Yeah. Um, but the, the other interesting thing about this artist's impression is, and in fact, something that Mike and I were talking about uh, this afternoon, that it, it's only really in recent years that uh, the awareness of the relevance of timber post holes has been growing. Uh, you know that we've we've tended to look at whether it's been henge ditches. Uh, you know these you know really big constructions, uh, but the relevance of finding just a few post holes is is major because. Mm. Uh, you know, in that artist's impression, I hope you caught a glimpse of it before it disappeared, that, uh, you know, four upright posts, there you go, 
Mm. So those uh, those houses raised on stilts, I say houses, could have been anything. Uh, but the fact that you just need four timber posts and, you know, and there's all sorts that you can do with it. Um, we don't know what the four post holes were about. But it is the relevance of, uh, you know, whether it's palisades or uh, or just very intermittent um, uh, separated posts, it's still, it tells you, a lot about uh, basic domesticity, really. Mm. Fencing. I mean, there there are places across uh, the uh, the Salisbury Plain, for example, around uh, around Stonehenge. There are just small timber post holes, which you have to interpret as fences. There's no other way to interpret them. Uh, so it's for, it, you know it's nice to see them taking notice of uh, timber. Mm. I, I felt, uh, I can't remember how many years it was, you know, when we first started out, you know, thinking about, I mean, basically, you know, because we started out with megaliths, we started off with stone stuff in the landscape, and I can't remember how long ago it was that uh, it, it felt like a sort of, oh, a, a, a light bulb moment that, oh, if only we could uh, we could know about the timber that was around these places, then that would help us interpret, or you know, what these stones in the landscape are about. It sort of felt uh, sort of revolutionary to me at the, at the time to think that, and it's only sort of latterly, as you, as you mentioned, that uh, the the attention seems to have been, you know, or, or uh, the um, uh, the the finding of timber, or the, probably the ability to detect, you know, the getting the eye in to detect and 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 um, and reflect the importance of timber, which disappears. It only leaves dark patches in the soil. So things that like that that would previously have been overlooked, and goodness knows, you know, cause, because loads of places have been uh, excavated previously without a nod, mm. perhaps, to... Um, looking at where there were timber posts uh, holes that might give, have given mm. a clue to the purpose of an otherwise enigmatic site. Um, mm. Anyway, uh, that is the, all there is to say uh, about that. I'm not going to read the rest of the articles. It's, it's, it's not. Uh, uh, no, very, well, it's it, again. Yeah. It's very much a watch this space um, in a scenario. They're still excavating. Uh, be mm. interesting mm -hmm. to see what um, what the actual excavation report says in its final yes, yes. form. If it's interesting, uh, we'll let you know. Yeah. Um, Thundercats, uh, he says, he's just added Dolmen Domenga to my list, his list of places to visit while in southern Spain. Hang about, Thundercats. You're in for a treat. <laughs> you are? <laughs> well, a little bit of one anyway, <laughs> yes. Uh, anything else? Um, uh, yeah, Sibylla says, uh, uh, granaries, keep the rodents out. Mm. Uh, and the pigs, yes. Mm. <laughs> Hello yes. to Marco from Portugal. Uh, as anything else, sorry, I'm just skipping through um, just to make sure we don't miss anything there. Um, uh, uh, oh, Frank says we had to dig ring, ring ditches around dwellings at an open air museum where I volunteer exactly for this because with the weather of late, we've had mushrooms coming through the wall. So Thundercat said, uh, sometimes I wonder if some of these ditches were designed to capture groundwater. And Frank is kind of confirming that as a practical use. Okay, well. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, interesting to um, thoughts. Um, so let's move on. We're going mm. to, we're taking you to Finland now and unusual ancient <laughs> graves <laughs> found near the Arctic, but no remains discovered inside, study says. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, just south of the Arctic Circle, within the vast forests of northern Finland, lies a sandy field dotted with dozens of unusual pits. Workers stumbled upon the site known as Tianyaro, Tianraro, Tianra, Tianyaro. Yes, ta Tanyaro. Um, so, that's a vague guess at how that's pronounced, and my humble apologies to people of Finland. Tanyaro, six decades ago, and since then its origins have remained elusive. But now, upon uh, conducting a comprehensive analysis of the site, researchers have determined 
hang on, uh, hang on to your hats, have determined it is likely a sprawling hunter-gatherer gatherer cemetery dating back some 6,500 years, according to a study published on December the 1st in the journal Antiquity. Such a large <coughs> cemetery at, uh, and you can interject at any time, Rupert, such a large cemetery at such a high northern latitude does not necessarily fit preconceptions about prehistoric foragers in this region. <laughs> no, you bet it doesn't. <laughs> or anywhere else come to that. Researchers affiliated with Finland's mm. University of Ulu said, mm. adding it may be time to recalibrate our expectations. You don't say. During excavations <laughs> conducted in 2018 and an analysis of archival fieldwork, researchers identified an estimated 115 to 200 pits. Most were rectangular in shape with dimensions around 7 feet in length and 2.5 feet in death, depth. No human remains were found inside. But thousands of artefacts, including pottery, there's pottery, uh, uh, ochre and burned animal bones were located. Uh, skillfully crafted chisels, chisels and hand-sized stones that could be fashioned into smaller bladed tools were also among the objects found. Aki Harkinen, one of the study's authors, told McClatchy News. Shall I read on just to get some clarification as to where we're coming from by this. It says, by comparing these pits to other Stone Age archaeological findings, researchers concluded that they were likely burial sites used by roaming peoples who would have foraged, hunted and fished in the region. Taniero should, in our opinion, be considered to be a cemetery site, researchers said, even though no skeletal material has survived in Taniero. Um, <laughs> There's a bit more to that, but uh, your thoughts so far, Mr. Soski? I think it's. Uh, do you know? I I I don't want to be overly critical of uh, of any archaeologists, but it's it's just a preposterous interpretation, mm -hmm. in my view. Basically, throughout Northern Europe and Scandinavia, the largest cemeteries, if we're going to use that term. I mean, to make a distinction, you know, a graveyard is where graves are around a church. A cemetery is where the burials are outside the community. So a cemetery is always on the outskirts of a settlement. Um, and uh, the largest cemeteries that have been found, really, that, you know, they max out at 20 actual burials. And here you've got up to 200, and they're saying it's a cemetery because they've found these pits in which they have found absolutely no human remains whatsoever. Um, it just it seems preposterous to me. And when you make the comparisons, for example, of um, places, I mean, uh, notably South America, you know, we've talked before about... Um, Mike's experience uh, in Argentina with the Pachamama. I think uh, you could uh, you could say more about that, Mike. But where <laughs> people are making offerings? Yes, uh, in, indeed. Um, uh, I mean, I would go on to sort of uh, um, let me get back to the page we were on. Um, it says complicating their conclusion though was the evidence of burnt material found inside of the sides of the pit, suggesting that it may have been hearths. However, the traces of child material was insufficient to prove pyrotechnic use. So the article goes on to say that um, the, the, the patterning of, of these pits, which is highly, which is very irregular, they're not organised in any pattern or anything like that, and some seem to encroach on um, the, you know, um, the adjacent uh, uh, pit, um, it is that it correlates with uh, settlements, you know, where... Uh, and you know that we we know of many we could probably name where burials take place beneath the floor of the individual houses. So um, it's or it's uh, been interpreted this site uh, as a as a hybrid um, thing where you you've got. Um, a, a settlement in an area and because uh, people are being buried within the, the settlement what remains are just the pits at the end of the day and so you know what looks like a, a cemetery um, but as Rupert says with absolutely no human remains 
and the uh, stuff that's in each one, remember, grave goods are not ubiquitous when you bury uh, people. And with this, the seem, I get the impression, anyway, that uh, grave goods seem to be ubiquitous. If you get pits that, uh, w which every single one has something in it of some value, that sounds to me much more like a votive pit where you you know you're throwing votive offerings and and, and the reason I, I, it it rings and resonates for me is that I had the privilege um, well about 15 years ago no more than that now um of being uh, up in um northern argentina in the high uh, areas in the in the plateaus up up there and going to a, a pachamama festival and we were invited into a family's home and behold, lo and behold, at the Pachamama Festival uh, at that time, they dug pits in their houses. And they mm. had a pit in the field and a pit in the, uh, the, the, the garage. They were, they were me me mechanics. And, uh, you know, after a, a good meal and a song and a celebration, stuff that was valued was put in the pit. Food, cigarettes, coke, you know bits and pieces and i saw it with my own eyes now i'm not for a moment suggesting that there's a direct connection between <laughs> northern argentina and uh, finland just inside the uh, the arctic circle or wherever it is the common denominator of course is human beings uh interacting you know with their cosmos with with you know their universe in some way and you know th this sort of practice the votive offering is that is universal, uh, where, where you get human beings and uh, and the earth and the, the people that depend upon the earth and the sun, the stars, the moon and everything. <clears throat> so, yeah, long story short, these pits occur to me as votive pits in, a, in, an, in mm. an enclosed settlement. And it seems quite natural uh, you know, to me. And there's so many examples of pits that have been paid far too much attention to, in, in, you know, as kind of um, uh, trans, uh, suggesting some kind of you know, mystic or special quality to them. And to the people, they are normal. They are the thing you do. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, it's, that's... It's, Sibylla has just said, uh, votive means dedicated to a deity, ancestor, yeah. or some such. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. And and uh, but as Mike said, you know, it's not like we're saying that's what it is. We're just saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you calling it a burial when there's absolutely no trace of um, of any physical remains? There's, there's nothing. Um, I mean, it also it struck me only half whimsically that these are seven foot long by two and a half feet wide uh now if you went out and caught yourself a wild boar uh and wanted to roast it on the spit then that's about the perfect size um <laughs> you know so if it was a fire pit and that reminded me of something that uh, that uh, most people don't know and i think this is a lovely bit of the word barbecue the word barbecue comes from old uh, old French, and it's barbe au coeur. Uh, barbe au coeur means from the beard, to, uh, well, literally, it means from the beard to the arse, uh, from the beard to the tail. Um, and uh, and it's from when we used to roast animals on spits. Barbecue comes from roasting animals on spits. Um, and again, I'm not saying that it is from people roasting things on spits. I'm just saying that a cemetery of 200 pits with absolutely mm. no human remains. Nah, right. doesn't ring true for me. So that's, that's where we're taking on, on that one. But there's another element to this, which the, the article itself seemed to uh, <laughs> touch on earlier, and that's the expectation of hunter-gatherers hunter uh, gathering in one place for long enough to leave their mark in the land in the form of a cemetery like this. And in a couple of the other articles that we'll be visiting tonight, we begin to see this thing unravelling about our expectation that hunter-gatherers were on the move all the time, etc. You agree, Rupert? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. 
Yep. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading comments. Yeah, oh, well, stop it. Um, the uh, you seem very close to the your camera very suddenly. I don't know what happened. It was something. Uh, do you it, know what? Uh, it I I haven't moved, and not, I don't know what's happened with the That's format. Bizarre. I can go further away. It's all right, but yeah, then I can't read the screen. Brilliant. Don't worry. Don't worry about it then. Um, that's that's right. Uh, yes, we'll come back to it again uh, later. But uh, our experience, and we wouldn't be we this, we wouldn't have picked up on this, I don't think, if we had not you know prior to our, in, you know our investigations uh, to do with our film Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. More on that later. And actually being uh, in Anatolia, actually being at Gebekli Tepe, and trying to understand what was going on in the years leading up to that, you know, uh, why, 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 why do we get these enormous settlements, and yet people were still are still uh, reckoned to be hunter gatherers, and we're suddenly realizing, no, oh, there's a whole great gap in our understanding, or at least in our nomenclature that we use to describe people um, that had not yet started farming they were not yet uh, dom they were not domesticating uh, cereals they were not domesticating animals yet and yet they um, were persisting and yet they were exploiting their landscape to such an extent that they could settle down um, in, in one place and call you know, one place their home and mm. uh, that's the surprise here as well when you get these concentrations, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I need to pick up on something because uh, Kate and Stuart have both commented uh, that pottery and to gatherer uh, seems odd. Uh, that as well. I, I think uh, that, but the, there is a, a <laughs> there is such a massive misunderstanding about. Uh, about what it means to be a hunter-gatherer. It, it doesn't mean that these people were nomadic and moving around. It means that they weren't technically farming. Um, so if you know, if you if you are in one place, and in fact, you, you know, Gobekli Tepe. So you're talking about pre-pottery Neolithic. Now the thing is that Gobekli Tepe is a glorious example that people there have made bowls and plates and dishes and storage vessels they've made them out of stone they are and they are so finely made some of them are decorated carved with uh, embellishments and uh, to go to those lengths you know these aren't farmers these are people who have they, they have a very nice settlement they've got a lovely town if you want that they live in they're just not farmers. They go out and they hunt and they bring meat back to the uh, to the village. They go mm -hmm. out and they gather grain and they bring it back to the village. Uh, you uh, you can make pots uh, within your village. It doesn't mean uh, you know you don't have to be a farmer to be using pottery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, you know uh, do you see what I mean? It's just it's not farming and uh, or hunter gatherer does not necessarily mean nomadic. No, indeed. I mean, and you get into the realm of pottery, and of course, then you be, then there's the element of portability, <laughs> that mm. you know, which came first, the settlement or the or the pottery, because probably uh, you wouldn't get have pottery if you were being nomadic, because of the portable portability <laughs> problem, and, and things like it's not impossible, you know, but it's more likely if you're in a settled situation. However, I think what the confusion probably is is the independent development of pottery when. The development of pottery was you know, not as early as you might think, considering you know how many uses of clay <laughs> people put to in you know over a period of fifteen thousand years uh, or more, uh, you know, until uh, pottery was actually a thing. Um, but I, I expect that, that by this time up there, you've got a certain amount of transmission going on from the farmers that had already crept up through the Balkans and uh, 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 and and that way. I don't know. I don't know. That's just something that needs. Uh, but I, I suspect there was a, a transmission of the idea of pottery rather than uh, it being independently 
um, made and developed by possibly, so yeah, probably Gunners, even. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's also important to bear in mind that there is an awful lot of um, there are an awful lot of styles of pottery with wide necks that it would have been very easy to tie. Um, uh, a cord around so that they could have been slung on whether it was over a donkey's back or uh, or you carried them over your shoulder uh, the the rope would not uh, or the cord would not last in the archaeological record but the pot would um uh so the use of pottery the transporting of pottery i don't have a problem with that at all i mean you know the the romans were very happy to make amphorae and ship them in vast quantities um you know there, there's nothing non-portable about pottery uh, it's just when they started using it and so many small uh you know drinking vessels even you know that you can make a cup out of birch bark that's, uh, you know, that's perfectly serviceable. Once again, it wouldn't last in the archaeological record. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just back to this contrary thing of, um, of what it means to be nomadic or settled. Uh, you know, it's, uh, farming is nothing yeah. to do with either. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's not nothing. It's not that it's nothing, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's a red this all this bears repetition. I think it's something we'll come back to time and time again. You know, so people get and it dr gets drilled into our heads as well because I've been surprised of the of the the lack of a definition of this. You know, uh, in, uh, interstitial, <laughs> is that the right word? Uh, phase in the whole of the development of uh, of agriculture. It's not hunter gatherer. Mm. Stop farming. There's a vast gap of development of uh, uh, of exploitation, of learning how to exploit a landscape so that you can settle down before, long before, um, you actually start domesticating uh, stuff, or we started domesticating stuff. Uh, shall we move on, Rupert? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I jumped one. My goodness gracious me. Uh, here we go. Uh, where are we going uh, now? We're going to a Stone Age cave dwelling found exactly as it was left 17,000 oh, years ago. Um, lovely, lovely, lovely. Yeah, th this is um, uh, archaeologists in northern Spain have uncovered what they describe as one of the best conserved Paleolithic dwellings in the world, dated to 16,800 years ago. Uh, the living space in the Lagama cave in Cantabria appears almost as it did when its ancient inhabitants abandoned the site with tools and other artefacts strewn across the floor. Sorry about it. can't get rid of these pictures from live science, apparently. Originally <laughs> uncovered in 1995, Lagama was inhabited by humans throughout the Upper Paleolithic and contains one of the most complete collections of rock art in Europe, spanning the old Stone Age all the way up to the site's des uh, desertion in the Magdalenian period. It was at this time, around 17,000 years ago, that a rockfall blocked the entrance to the cave, sealing its contents like a prehistoric time capsule. Gee, I would uh, have loved to have been the archaeologist that was the first to see that. That would have been yeah. uh, something of a thrill. My goodness. Hmm. However, while the main chamber may have been inaccessible for millennia, humans continued to occupy the surrounding caverns, as evidenced by the presence of kitchen middens, from the Middle Stone Age, uh, copper and Bronze Age graves, and uh, an Iron Age fort and tombs from both the Visigothic era and Middle Ages. Despite the site's long history of use, though, the ancient cave dwelling remained undiscovered until now. According to the University of Cantabria, the uh, oval-shaped space measures around 5 metres squared, 54 square feet, and is delineated by a series of stone blocks and stalagmites which fix to the ground a structure made of sticks and hides supported by a nearby ledge in the cave wall. In the centre of the living space is a half, surrounded by a multitude of items that have, would have been used in everyday life by the cave's ancient inhabitants. Uh, tools to produce stone, antler, bone of artefacts, uh, those doing, used during the butchering of animals and the working of hides. Ooh, I didn't read that before. 4,614 items retrieved so far. Uh, 
Uh, the researchers have also found spears, needles, and a proto-harpoon, whatever they mean by that. But the cave was also found to contain a number of artistic pieces, including an aurochs bone, an aurochs bone engraved with the image of both an aurochs and a human face. According to the researchers, this is the only artifact of its kind ever discovered from Paleolithic Europe. And there are pendants, pendants that would have been worn by the cave's inhabitants were also retrieved, with the majority of items being made of deer, horse and bison bones. Mm. Uh, obviously, work is ongoing. Um, but as far as a you know a preliminary thing is concerned, that's uh, great. I hope you know that that, that is an actual image uh, from mm. inside the cave. Doesn't actually tell us much, but um, no, uh, I I, I uh, was a little bit frustrated. I couldn't find an image of um, of the carved aurochs bone with the carving of the aurochs mm. and a human face. Mm. Uh, it, it'll be nice to see that. Uh, I didn't know about it before. Um, mm. Uh, but yeah, I shall keep looking. Uh, it's a, a, it's a wonderful thing, really. Just that cave as an illustration of people not moving. You know, if you found a good place to live, why move? And, and the fact that it goes from seventeen thousand years ago or sixteen thousand hundred uh, all the way to Iron Age. Come on, that's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, we don't know. They may have been using this cave itinerantly on an itinerant basis uh, to m match the uh, uh, migration of the herds and, and that kind of thing. I, I think a, a more in-depth examination of the kinds and, uh, of, and sizes of the spearheads and arrowheads that they were using will indicate what sort of, uh, what sort of um, meat they were hunting at uh, least. But the trouble is with when we find evidence of people living in caves, and again, we're going to go back to this thing about assumptions about, you know, what kind of people they were. And actually, um, at the, about, around about the same time as these people were living in caves, the Natufians in the Levant, and uh, the fer Fertile Crescent, most, you know, northern Israel, that kind of uh, area, were still living in caves, and yet they were living sophisticated lives where they were managing the uh, area, you know, around the, the cave, and they were settled. You know, they, they were mm -hmm. well settled. They'd got the environment so well uh, handled you know, that they were extracting... Um, the uh, the most they could from every every element of the land around them, you know, still hunting mm. big stuff, but they'd switch to hunting smaller stuff as well. This is why I'm talking about the smaller uh, projectiles, uh, which tells you that people are more settled because they decided to start hunting smaller mammals, a rabbit, you know, mm. and, and think things like that. Not only that, but wildfowl and you know birds and uh, and and stuff like that. And at the same time, no evidence here, obviously, but the Natufians were, were also gathering um, cereals. Um, but I'm just trying to knock on the head the idea that these people would have been particularly primitive because they were living in caves. No, they were living in caves because it was a bloody good idea <laughs> and it suited them well. Mm. And they probably were utilising the ground and probably had buildings that we know not of, uh, not too far from the cave mouth that they could utilise as mm. well. I mean, let's face it. Well, we know, one cave um, does not a, it, does not a um, a community make. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> cave is probably reserved for the uh, upper echelons of uh, the, whatever community yes. it, it, it was. Uh, your your memory is better than mine on these sites, but is it yeah. um, Abifanan? Uh, which is the cave system where outside the cave they uh, they had leveled off various terraces? Where they had houses Anan, it or is dwellings, Anan. anyway, think, yeah. spreading out from, I think it was Abu Fainan. Um, uh, yeah, and, I'm going to put my neck on the found, line and say it was. Yeah, uh, a, yeah you mean E Y N A N. Ainan. Um, yes. Oh, I thought yeah. it was Fainan, but uh, you, you. Oh, um, I think sometimes it is. Yeah, you know? may well yeah. be right. One or the, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but they they found. Um, uh, abalone shell 
jewelry there as well oh, yeah. uh so uh you know again it's one of those things of you don't sit around making jewelry uh if you're really stressed out about how you're actually going to be surviving from one day to the next yeah. that's a pretty settled and kind of almost self-indulgent thing to be doing uh, i would i would can i would say also that you don't make jewelry i .e. you don't make stuff for for looking good for appearances sake unless you're well integrated into a larger uh, society and, and community where you're intermingling with other other people so you know one cave as i say you know that may be uh, a, a, you know a small or extended family support but not a community so mm. you know um the fact that they are, they were ornamenting themselves suggests that uh, um they were um, you know conscious of the importance of uh, elevation amongst peers and, mm. and other other groups um so the notion of yeah. uh uh it's, yeah them being primitive and living in caves uh yeah just throw it out get away get away from it clear the mind of it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing what they could with what they had and they're doing it well and surviving well as rupert says you don't sit down to carve stuff unless you've got things sorted and you, you're not under under stress so hats off to them <laughs> mm. yeah yes quite right <laughs> okay uh let's move on oh excellent let's go to the mediterranean uh neolithic shipwreck was likely just a canoe <laughs> Uh, but the odd yeah. obsidian is real. That's a bit of an enigmatic headline. I don't want mm. to read the whole of this article because it is quite long. Um, yeah. Maybe we could praise it ourselves uh, a, a, a bit, you know, using the uh, the headlines as a kind of a um, um, a memoir uh, here, Rupert. Uh, what you've got there is a picture of a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> or a member of the Italian police force anyway, because it was them diving off the coast of Capri that discovered these, uh, uh, how many lumps? Was it just one or two uh, lumps of oh, obsidian? Uh, uh, well, no, there was only one, um, mm -hmm. but they suspected that they were going to find others. Mm. And it was another journal who took that and converted it to a headline of a collection of obsidian artifacts or you know it was it was somebody else who made up the plurality there was can just I one just, piece can I just uh, uh, to interrupt because otherwise I'll forget uh, faces in the stone yes. uh, got, thank you for your efforts and I do <laughs> you do manage to find a way faces in the stone is trying to find a way of giving us money which is <laughs> Bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I tell you what, the, we would be most grateful for is the buy me a coffee uh, link in the description below, which uh, gives money directly to our fund for the making of the film sit for series Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. Going to take you tell you a bit more of that that in, in a moment. Um, but thanks for your efforts, mm. uh, Faces in the Stone. Just thought. I'd, sorry to interrupt, but I thought I'd catch that. Uh, yeah. Uh, off you go, Rupert. Sorry. Oh, thank you. It's in the stones. Just said I'll just join Patreon. <laughs> thank you. For Great. That. See you around. See you around. Look forward to it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry. Back to you, Rupert. You were saying. No, no, no. I'd kind of finished. It was just one piece. It's a big lump of uh, obsidian. They said it weighed seventeen yeah. pounds. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's you know it's a hefty old lump. Um, I think the thing to say that it, this has been in the news and it pricked our ears up because we um, have been paying a lot of attention to Obsidian recently because it was one, as the article states, it was one of the main and most valuable commodities in, uh, you know, pre -pottery, in the pre-pottery Neolithic and even uh, before in the Adriatic, Mesolithic and, and stuff like that, this stuff was getting around all over the world, you know, and there were not that many sources because the source has to be a volcanic 
Uh, so the areas from which you can source obsidian are relatively uh, small, um, but uh, obsidian is very, very special. It is the sharpest, you know, it, when it's been napped, it is the sharpest uh, uh, material available anywhere. Even today, it is still the sharpest material you can get. So you can imagine, you know, the value uh, of the, these things in, uh, in pre-metal um, societies. So what we've got in our heads is uh, obsidian turning up in Turkey, in uh, Çatalhöyük, you know, uh, uh, certainly a lot. They had their own local sources, but there is a particular source in the middle of the Aegean on Milos, and so much obsidian was coming from Milos and circulating around the Aegean and the Mediterranean from, uh, from a long time ago. And it's our thesis, or... Uh, whatever that probably that trade that that the early neolithic farmers integrated with and crossed the aegean to you know come into europe and spread farming that way um yeah you'll hear more about that uh, further on so obsidian incredibly important so our ears were picked pricked up when the claims were made that this must have been the site of a neolithic shipwreck hooray there ain't no such thing as a <laughs> neolithic shipwreck anywhere that never ha has has been um, yeah. The earliest uh, sort of shipwreck we have is the uh, oh gosh, I always forget the name of it. Go Rupert. Aluburan. I'm not sure the Aluburan is the oldest, but it was certainly it was the, the largest ship. trading seagoing uh, shipwreck. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. The Aluburan, which uh, went down off uh, Bodrum, was it, or it's in the Bodrum Museum now? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh, in yeah. Turkey. Um, so, but a Neolithic shipwreck, you know, that would tell us loads. Yeah. However, I'm afraid this article is largely about sort of putting, pouring uh, cold water, if you'll forgive the slight pun, uh, on the... It's a, uh, it's a lovely uh, article. It, it just yeah, takes it yeah. apart piece by piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and it's to do with the overexcitement and uh, uh, stuff that authorities often display when they've got exciting stuff possibly going on in their backyard so they like to you know push the the boundaries so no it's just a lump of obsidian there is no shipwreck yet there is no and the likelihood mm. of finding one are disappearingly small unfortunately i mean yeah. crossed fingers gee love it <laughs> um uh, the idea However, it's a mystery that seems, you know, needs to be solved because a lump of obsidian that size, ready to be napped into whatever materials and tools and stuff were available from it, would be hugely valuable. You know, it'd be like yeah. you know, losing several blocks of gold over the side of a, uh, a, a boat. You know, so Lord knows yeah. what it was. Yeah. Uh, Helen says, who's Neolithic? Really good question. <laughs> really good question. Uh, yeah, yes, that's an extremely good question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. For those for those of you that uh, don't know, I mean, it should explain that 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 Neolithic is a term that is it means something very very different to Britain and Northern Europe than it does yeah. from say going into Eastern Europe and and on into Turkey. That um, the the Neolithic in uh, in in Turkey. I mean, it's thousands of years before uh, before the Neolithic of of Britain. Yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's a very good question. You know, the, yeah. the, we have well, all the these earliest Neolithic. Term. Say, I mean, uh, the, the the date they're chucking about is between six thousand uh, BC and three thousand five. So, you know, it's in the yeah yeah Neolithic so, so ballpark it, for it, the Mediterranean. It, it, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. But uh, but it, you know uh, uh, picking up on it, Helen's question of who's Neolithic, I mean that, that's a very good question. But it yeah. is ours, yes. It's it, it's, uh, it's Western it's, Europe Neolithic, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, but the the importance of the finding a shipwreck is because we need to know what kind of vessels that were that they were transporting stuff in because we know the trade was going on in the Neolithic, mm. you know, right through from. You know, early days, uh, right up and well, forever. Um, but mm. uh, what vessels they were using, and it, I just find it fascinating that even in this article, which is a little bit cynical, uh, not cynical but skeptical, um, is uh, saying that the expectation it says it right there, 
Uh, it says, over the past few weeks, major news outlets have written about the recovery of a chunk of volcanic glass from a Neolithic shipwreck off the coast of Italy. What you need to know is, is that it was not a ship, but a canoe. And there exists not a solitary shred of evidence to suggest that the, can the canoe sank in the Neolithic. Nor is there a shred of evidence to suggest that it must have been a canoe. That's my point. I was rather surprised by that. You know, without the evidence, you cannot declare that all they were sailing about with were canoes. I suggest because yeah. of the extent of trade, even back in the Mesolithic, for goodness sake, they have something much more substantial than a, a dugout to be plying trade up and down the Adriatic. <laughs> You know, I, I'd, I'd take it the other way as well, though. That you know, you, you can you can make a, a very big raft much more easily than you can make a yeah, a, a big uh, dugout or, or whatever. Mm. And we know that the Polynesians um, historically, we know from the accounts of uh, of James Cook that uh, the Polynesians would lash uh, canoes together. Mm. Uh, so you know, basically having this uh, large a uh, rowable collection of, of vessels where they would transport, you know, hundreds of people at a time, all lashed together. Uh, mm. So there's all sorts of ways that these things could have been done. But as you say, yes, the notion of it being a... a mm. Well, the assumption that it would have been a canoe and the statement that it was a shipwreck, I mean, both of them are, well, dubious yeah. in the extreme. But my point is that if you're setting out to sea with a deliberate intent and if you're setting out with cargo, you need to be fairly certain you're going to arrive at the particular place that you, you a raft and things like that. You're rather at the mercy of the, of the elements. You're not able to direct where you're going so much. So I, uh, if I was a betting man, I'd go with John Tanks, uh, you know, who says they were probably a lot like the Luberon boat, you know. And absolutely, uh, why not? We just, uh, you know, just wood doesn't survive. I'm, sh I'm sure they'll find something one day and prove one of us uh, or other of well, us right. Well, it's it's worth it's worth pointing out. You know, if you remember that um, it was only a couple of years ago that they found that uh, boat making. You can't call it a boat mm. yard, but they found a place off the north coast of um, the Isle of Wight. Uh, where uh, it, it 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 was a boat making uh, structure, and they could tell from what they excavated there that there were carpentry techniques that had been used there that uh, that took a you know took those kinds of techniques back like one or two thousand years uh, that you know previously they hadn't thought that we were capable of these sorts of things um, and it, it does beg the question that was Mesolithic that was 8,000 years old um, mm. and you know so you know all these assumptions about mm. people must have been doing very crude things yeah. well you know Gebekli Tepe uh, again is a very good example of things not necessarily being crude 10,000 yeah. years ago uh, Fanny Nuff asks, where did they think this obsidian is from? America, Russia? Um, no, um, the main source I th would suspect, you know, b being the Mediterranean. Um, I mean, I, I, I know of no other, I mean, the most important site, and it's still, you know, qu quarried there today, I would have thought, is Milos in the Aegean. Mm. Um, that's well within the, uh, you know, that's easy. I mean, there are sources in Turkey uh, as well. Um, but I would mm -hmm. suspect an Adriatic source, um, and Milos is the most important of those sources. Uh, I, Aegean, I don't think you mean? of any uh, the, in the Aegean. Yes, I, I don't know of any sources that are particular to the Mediterranean or closer, you know, to Italy or in Italy. Maybe, mm. maybe it could be Italian. If so, do you? I don't know. Okay. Mm. Um, yes. If we said all we need to say about that, uh, I think we've sort of preceded the article a, a bit. Uh, I think. So. So if we haven't confused the hell out of everybody, um, yeah. it's a yeah. shipwreck with obsidian that probably wasn't a shipwreck, but there's a piece of obsidian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Why did we include that? It's interesting. There's a piece of obsidian that's at the bottom of the Mediterranean. How did it get there? Yeah. Mm. Uh, oldest fortress in the world. Would you like to know where the oldest fortress did, in the did, world Did you is? not want to uh, take a halfway break and show people the... Uh, uh, well, yes, we've been talking a lot about uh, Gebekli Tepe and, uh, you know, the 
people that were responsible for it. Uh, and uh, we've, as promised right at the beginning, we've got a, a clip to show you that Rupert and I re recorded, uh, what, about three weeks ago? Um, uh, at, uh, yeah, at, it's not long, yeah, uh, at Gebekli Tepe. Um, and the purpose of doing it is, uh, is to show and to uh, try and blow this thing out of the water that has got locked in out there uh, in the internet, in the world, that um, Gebekli Tepe was not a residential site, was, but was solely a ceremonial site that people went to uh, occasionally to uh, go and do their worshipful stuff. Thank you, Thundercats. You're very kind. <laughs> yes, thank uh, you. Indeed. Oh, there's a question. Have you been to Brinkadafana in... Well, no, it's on my wish list, Thundercats. Thank you for reminding me. I'd like to take the camera <laughs> up there. Fabulous. Uh, so back to uh, Gobekli Tepe. Um, and a, a bit of context for this is that we just directly to the main buildings where the canopy is uh, of uh, the, over the the huge um, main four main special buildings of Gebekli Tepe that everybody knows so well directly to the west there's a a, a large strip of excavations uh, which is only a small proportion of the other excavations that go on outside of that main area of Gebekli Tepe over you know the top of the tail to the north and to the nor northwest that uncover other aspects of of uh, the the whole Gebekli Tepe site. Um, so this little this clip this film it's only five minutes long is Rupert and I walking along this strip of uh, of excavations uh, in order to uh, delight and uh, hopefully surprise you with what's there. <laughs> Shall I roll VT? Yeah. Roll VT. <laughs> <laughs> there were people here. <laughs> there were people here. There were lots of people here. Mm -hmm. Do you know, this is a perfect spot uh, to show something that a lot of people don't see and don't know about. And that's that everybody talks about at Gebekli Tepe that there are the special buildings maybe they were temples but these special buildings and people still believe that there were no residential uh, places here but mm. actually there's so much residential stuff here building upon building upon building and that's what you're looking at now yeah and if you needed any proof that these were domesticated areas <laughs> ah look at this beautiful limestone Basin. Goodness knows how long it take, <laughs> took to make that basin, yeah. let alone, you know, yeah. anything but else. Whether it's a, a storage vessel of some sort, what have you, don't know. But, yeah. but there is, I mean, if in the back of this house, so there's another bench at the back, you know, that it's just places for people to be comfortable. Yeah. Always got to imagine it with a roof as well. And that yeah, pillar the T pillar there at the back, supporting. what's remained a bit, that would have been supporting the uh, the roof. And what what's so why they look so alien to us because they don't have doors is because, uh, like uh, most of the other structures in this part of the world, access was through the roof. Yeah, with ladders going down into the inside. But these are all houses, little houses. Bench at the back of that one. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's staggering when I mean from here you can look over to the opposite hill. Yeah. I say the opposite hill, just the the other side of the main site. And that's all more residential houses over the other side. There are so many of them. There were a lot of people living here. Yeah. Uh, so all the old information about this only being a ritual mm. site is just not true at all. And uh, the area that we've traversed, we've just walked past now, is but a fraction of this domesticated or residential yeah. uh, area. Um, oh, interestingly, uh, just here, we've got a corner of a skylight. Uh, that stone there would have been supported uh, in the roof 
and that's yeah. how people would have got down into the building potentially or it might just have been um, to let yeah. the light in so much of it <laughs> <laughs> and all leading down to the site that so many people <laughs> <laughs> so many people are familiar with and you know it's a wonderful thing to stand here with people milling about because at least that gives a sense of busyness That's with true. that many people living in this 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 place uh yeah, yeah it would have been noisy would have been smelly it would have been, been noisy and smelly yeah. for sure yeah. yeah yeah so i hope that makes the point there's a lot more to Gobekli Tepe than a temple site. Yes. Yes. And so much that still hasn't even been excavated. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? <laughs> the, the volume went right down uh, when, you turned, when, when you turned yourself off from the bottom. Um, uh, yes, it went right down for me. Um, thank you, Hyperbomb Fuzzle. You oh, are a, bless you, kind <laughs> sir. a fine person. Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much. Um, I, I need to pick up on who was it said? Stuart. It was Stuart uh, who said, unfortunately, whilst you were being careful about not showing the boar statue, another channel has. Uh, yeah. I know. Thank you. And I think it was you, Stuart, who was it you that gave me the heads up to it the other day? Um, uh, because uh, as a, I, a lot of you know that we were being respectful to Lee, Dr. Lee Clare, because the Turkish authorities had made it uh, clear that they wanted to be the ones that put it out to the world. So we should all keep quiet. And nobody knows anything it. about the boar. Uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, talking about. and and then, as you say, um, uh, well, ancient artifacts, uh, Matt uh, got it. I don't know where Matt got it from, to be honest, but, yeah. um, uh, but he put it out, and uh, and so uh, we contacted Lee straight away and said, uh, "Do you still want us to keep it quiet?" And he said, "Hell no!" <laughs> he said, "No, too late now." I was really annoyed that it had got out because he was trying to do the right thing, and um, yeah. uh, he said, "No, no, no, you 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 run with it now." So you might have seen. I mean, I I put a load of pics in our social media yeah. uh, stuff uh, recently, but there's. We've got film of that boar. You'll be getting that. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that snippet you've just seen, uh, that is just, well, it, it's nothing. We've got so much to share, and uh, we've got so much to share like that of Gebekli Tepe as you've never seen it before, we promise you. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, there's loads of material to come from our visit, uh, even on top of, you know, above and beyond uh, the stuff that we've got for the, the main film for uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, need to pick up on uh, on a couple more things here. Uh, uh, Rhonda has said, is the jury out on it being intentionally buried? Uh, no, the jury is not out. That is completely no. wrong information. Uh, it was it was Carl Schmidt who'd interpreted that uh, that way to begin with. But uh, the excavations over the last several years mm. have have shown very clearly that that was not the case at all, and that the uh, the site was it was completely covered through the hill slumping down uh, on top of it. Uh, and there's there's various ways we don't have time right now to go into all of that, but there's various ways that they can be a hundred percent certain of that. But no, it yeah. was absolutely not intentionally buried yeah. at all in fact in fact part of the uh, structure of the way you see the special buildings uh, down there uh, a lot of the double walling is to do with their awareness of that slip and trying to prevent it encroaching on, um, on those uh, on the buildings the, the slip coming down the hill you have to be there to really appreciate how steep that slope is um, mm. Yeah, the the Gebekli Tepe, the, the the special buildings being you know a bit down the slope from the actual top of the the hill or the tell as it were, and it, it's it's quite vertiginous, vertiginous, isn't it? Looking down into 
uh, the uh, special buildings from uh, from above and from up the hill. Isn't vertiginous. It's a bit late in the day to be using like vertiginous. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it, no, it is. And in fact, I mean, for those of you that don't know, because uh, you know, obviously we've uh, we've got a lot of film and we've got a lot of pictures, and we've we've said some of it to you in updates so some of you might not have picked it up but one of the really enthralling things about Gebekli Tepe as a site if you bear in mind that it's still only a tiny percentage of the site that's been excavated you know I mean five six seven percent something like that and that the site as a whole is 20 hectares so you're talking about 50 acres um, as as a whole and they've done ground penetrating radar under a few other bits of it and where the archaeologists cabins are so what they use as their offices when they're on site basically they know that when you're standing in between those cabins that under your feet uh, are more special buildings um more t pillar buildings and uh, now what they know looking out across the landscape uh, you can uh, you can see uh, you have where where the land undulates you're wondering if his hands on screen uh, that the domestic houses are on the uplands and then down into the slopes you go down to the special buildings and uh, and so looking at the ground penetrating radar images and looking at you look out across the landscape and you can just see this ocean of unexcavated um, T pillar buildings and residential houses. There's <laughs> just so much of it. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah it is. It's quite staggering. Quite oh, staggering. Oh, um, has <laughs> gone mad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you think we're worth it. We yeah. really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, yes, it's. Uh, go on. You say it. While well, I was, I was going to, going to say was, uh, we're sparking off, you know, quite a few questions. Even you know, it's like like the blue touch paper. We could uh, spend the rest of the evening because there are so many avenues yeah, we can now we go. Having been there, so many things uh, we could go off into uh, you know, rabbit holes. We could go down uh, w with this. Uh, mm. But rest assured that it'll be coming out over the next uh, weeks and uh, and months. There's so much to, uh, to to show you. And if we answered all your questions, mm. you know, it, it would keep us going forever. Because the answers to some of the questions are really quite detailed, aren't they? Uh, the, the, you know, the, the support yes. for the evidence for this, that and that. It, it, uh, it takes a bit of um, explanation sometimes. You know, something that is, is, can be dealt with quite quickly. But uh, uh, it's so rich. It is so rich, that site. It's way, way, way above and beyond more than, uh, you know, just a temple. Uh, it's well, the incredible. truth is we, we came away um, quite shell-shocked from the point of view of just how much information there is to impart. Um, uh, you know, I mean, yes, we were surprised by, uh, by various aspects, but it, it's it's the fact that you know we went over there with the intention of filming some stuff for Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge, and we found that well, the element of it that we need for Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge is you know fine, got that, but there's all this stuff. All this stuff. It's like well, there's there's, there's another ten it's... programs here of stuff that uh, yeah. that people just don't know about, and stuff that never gets discussed. I mean, you've already seen that. Uh, you know yeah. those residential buildings. How often does anybody ever talk about those? They don't, yeah. um, and and that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, in yeah. terms of uh, uh, in information mm -hmm. that is yet to come out. Um, Bardo Mahi. Can I, was can I pick up on a few of these? Yes, yes. I was going to say. Well, I was picking Look, up on Bardo's uh, question there. Uh, was there evidence of infrastructure to keep those low areas from flooding? Uh, I would uh, just. To, Low areas uh, would uh, not describe it well. The whole site is very high up, so we're not we're, we're yeah. not talking about Gobekli Tepe down in a low area. It's in a hollow on the side mm. of a hill that's already quite yeah. high up. However, there's evidence yeah. of infrastructure to manage water 
That's for sure. That's I can definitely tell you that. And I'll leave it at that for the moment. Otherwise, of course, we'll, like I say, we'll go down one of those rabbit holes. But there's, yes, there's evidence yes. of the management of water. Uh, um, just very briefly, a couple. Uh, Roxy said, uh, can you say the average size of the people uh, give her a better idea of visualising living in those houses? Pretty much the same as us. I can't yeah. actually remember the details. There, there were details because um, they've only found uh, a couple of burials uh, there. But, you know, not significantly yeah, yeah. different from us, really not. Yeah. Um, it, may help you, it may help you to, uh, when I say, uh, I don't know if everybody agrees with me, you know, that, that knows the site, uh, you know, having investigated or, you know, been and stood around in um, the those buildings, those domestic buildings and their proximity, um, it's... Gebekli Tepe is more like Chatel Hoyek than people think. So, you know, if you know mm. the houses at Chatel Hoyek, you wouldn't be far wrong, you know, to imagine that kind of size and mm. of, of, of enclosure and, and smaller uh, as, as giving you an idea. Uh, somebody, what was yeah. it? Um, it is, isn't there a, still a sacred tree at the top where locals occasionally congregate for ceremony? Yes, there is, uh, Daniel. It, it, uh, yes, you depends what you mean. There's by still, still a sacred tree as if it's always been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think um, the tree is recent, but uh, yeah. uh, nevertheless. The, <laughs> yeah, people do tie their prayer ribbons in the trees still. Yeah. Uh, a few people have mentioned uh, the the color the pigment uh, uh, uh the surprises was that the the wild boar statue uh, that we were talking about uh, that some of you may have seen the fact that it still has red paint in its mouth mm -hmm. and uh, and it still has uh, you can say you can see that the underside was painted black um not so much uh, left of that now, but clearly it was uh, it was painted, and that makes you question what the whole of the site would have looked like. Um, yeah. uh, it, because if they did use colour ubiquitously, then that would have been quite impressive. Obviously, the range of colours is very open to debate because in you know, ochre and charcoal, for example, well, that's easy enough. Uh, but well, think of the range so, of colours, you know, uh, you know 1500 years later at uh, Chatel Hoyuk, black and mm, red, yeah, but uh, yeah, and white, and white, and white. So, you know, I mean, it could look, it could look very dramatic, and also, uh, one thing that we don't know, uh, there's no evidence of plaster walls, um, at uh, Agabekli Tepe. There is evidence, uh, I say evidence, they're very clearly, they had terrazzo floors. Um, mm. So they were very good at making flat uh, uh, compacted um, uh, how would you describe a terrazzo floor? I mean, it's like flattened stone fragments. It almost looks like a kind of mosaic, but it is just yeah, yeah. Um, tamped down uh, floor. Uh, I yeah, there's no evidence for plaster there, but even but it, you know even if they'd coloured with uh, you know if you had white walls from gypsum or, or what have you, I don't know. Okay. Um, but certainly they used pigment. We just don't know to what extent. So Rupert, we've got three articles left that we were going to uh, cover. Um, choices, <laughs> yeah. choices. I mean, we could answer more questions about uh, Gebekli Tepe, or we could honour. Um, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, the it's such a dilemma because just... I've just seen it. I've seen another. I, can I just say this very quickly Please. and then we'll yeah, move yeah, on? Go, because go, it's go. an important point to make. Grasshoppers said um, Gobekli wasn't a standalone site; it was surrounded by other sites that included yes. cut rock caves and such. A really important point here that in in more recent field surveys, they have identified hundreds, literally hundreds of other sites. Now, that's not to say that these are all T-pillar sites. Some of them will just be uh, encampments and settlements. But a lot of them will be other T-pillar sites. We're talking about a huge amount of other really substantial settlements in the region. The problem, of course, is that there will never be enough money or man hours to uh, to excavate them all. So it's going to be a very difficult decision-making process for um, for the authorities as to where the money is going to be spent. 
but uh, but nevertheless there are many many sites you know Gobekli Tepe is not in any way unique mm -hmm. okay uh thank you for all your uh questions uh, about Gobekli Tepe there'll be uh, yeah we, we'll be answering a lot of these you know with the stuff that uh, that's coming up um mm. but one th thing uh, I can uh, promise you and that's uh, you know and it this wasn't intentionally created uh, you know shot to deliver this but there's so much uh, footage of our three days um, that there's enough footage to um, film what will be for you a Gobekli Tepe experience as you follow us through those th three days the chats with Lee the, the our first descent into the into building D and 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 the ore and stuff and uh, explanations uh, and introductions to the other excavations on the site and uh, just some mind blowing uh, discoveries. So it'll be sort of fly on the wall stuff, uh, and there's a, a lot of it. So that's one thing that I want to get out uh, to you, which I I hope you you'll enjoy. I can't promise when exactly that'll come out, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, soon, soon. And I'm sure within that, quite a lot of your questions would be uh, answered. Uh, mm. <clears throat> and and quite a lot of questions also provoked by that. Anyway, what was I going to say? Oldest fortress in the world. <laughs> yes, shall we take you there eventually? <laughs> yeah, oldest. Do you know what? It's something I. It, it always annoys me when anybody says it's the oldest something in the world. It's the oldest that we yet know about. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, here we go. Oldest fortresses. Fortresses. Oh, the plural. In the world. <clears throat> in a groundbreaking archaeological discovery, an international team led by archaeologists from the Freie Universität Berlin have uncovered fortified prehistoric settlements in a rote region of Siberia. The results of their research revealed that hunter-gatherers, here we go again, yeah. hunter-gatherers in Siberia constructed complex structures, complex defense structures around their settlements 8,000 years ago. This finding reshapes our understanding of early human societies, challenging the idea that only with the advent of agriculture would people have started to build permanent settlements with monumental architecture and developed complex social structures. It's like sort of waiting for the number 24 bus. You wait for an hour and then five of them all arrive at once. It's like this. You wait for years for evidence um, that uh, agriculture and uh, animal husbandry weren't prerequisites for societal complexity. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> all these examples <laughs> occur uh, at once. You, you can find out in a, in a few minutes' time why it was so funny that you should use the energy of, uh, of, of buses coming at once because Jez has just uh, uh, made another analogy with a bus stop. <laughs> we come back to that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 the investigation centred uh, centered on the fortified settlement of Amnia, I think Amnia, uh, acknowledged as the northernmost Stone Age fort in Eurasia, where the team of researchers conducted fieldwork in 2019. Uh, the group was led by Professor Henny Pejanka. Archaeologist at Free University at Berlin and Natalia uh, Chakina, archaeologist at uh, Yekatern oh God, Yekaterinburg, Yekaterinburg, also, uh, Russia. Among the team's members were German and Russian researchers from Berlin, Kiel, and Yekaterinburg. Tanya Schreiber, archaeologist at the Institute of Prehistoric Archaeology in Berlin and co-author of the study, explains, through detailed archaeological examinations at Amnia, we collected samples for radiocarbon dating confirming the prehistoric age of the site and establishing it as the world's oldest known fort. Oldest known. Very good. Well done. Yeah. Our new... Uh, paleobotanical and strategi uh, stratigraphical examinations reveal that inhabitants of Western Siberia led a sophisticated lifestyle based on the abundant source of the taiga 
environment. Uh, they caught fish from the Anya River, hunted elk and reindeer uh, using bone and stone tip spears. Uh, their, to preserve their surplus of fish oil and meat, they crafted elaborately decorated pottery. Here we, again, here we go. Approximately 10 Stone Age fortified sites are known to date with pit houses and surrounded by earthen walls and wooden palisades, suggesting advanced architecture and defensive uh, capabilities. Um, so it goes on to uh, liken the sites to other sites. Indeed, the, it says the Siberian findings, along with other global examples like Gobekli Tepe in Anatolia, mm -hmm contribute to a broader reassessment of evolutionist notions that suggest a linear development of societies from simple to complex. Yeah, mm. we're getting that blown out of the water. In spades, mm. uh, pre-agriculturalists. Yes. Thank you, uh, Eric. You know, the uh, the term... That's quite nice, isn't uh, it? Or proto-agriculturalists, yes. Yeah, yes, uh, well done, the, the, the term uh, hunter-harvesters hunter has been uh, t coined as well. I uh, can't remember mm. who by now. I uh, should remember. But going back to the top, I tell you what, that, that the, um, um, you probably can't see it, um, the, the uh, profile uh, of, well, it's not a profile, obviously, it's a, a, a plan view. The uh, geography of that sort of reminds me of Crickley Hill in, uh, in Gloucestershire. Yeah, I know what you mean. R Rupert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you uh, put your defensive structures in that kind of an area, you know, obviously that uh, area there would have a heck of a view, and also it'd be relatively unassailable from up the slope. That's the you know, so the the angle of approach to anybody trying to take your position would have to be along the uh, you know, the plateau from the from the from the right there in that image. Mm. If you see what I mean. Uh, uh, yeah. That reminds me very strongly of, of, of Crickley Hill. Now, the yeah, thing is, Jez why... Said, to be fair... Yep. Uh, Jez said, to be fair, modern hunter-gatherer Bushman tribes will create defences most nights while as, uh, whilst out on hunts, normally dragging thorn bushes into a fence. Makes sense for something slightly substantial. Uh, mm. yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's true, isn't it? It's. I think it's the fact that uh, that historically the... The notion of hunter gatherer has, uh, uh, you know, it's it's just another aspect of it flying in the face of this uh, nomadic existence. You know, if you're making a promontory fort, then you're clearly well settled. Mm. Um, so it, it it is the reinforcement of this completely new understanding of what it meant to be a hunter gatherer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to. We don't know, but to conjecture upon you know, that which what they're actually protecting. In my imagination, as uh, I was talking with Rupert earlier about this, in my imagination that if you've got a particular site where herding animals, uh, migrating animals, you know, traverse through a valley or through um, uh, <clears throat> a, a river valley or there's a particular river river crossing, then domain over that would probably, and view over that um, as your catchment area, would probably confer considerable advantages uh, on you. Mm. So, you know, that is one reason to permanently defend uh, a, a position so that your tribe gets the benefit of uh, this particular crossing where the uh, herds are vulnerable. All sorts of uh, reasons. I mean, it, it could be that the despite its location, it's not a you know friendly uh, environment that I wouldn't have thought pretty uh, raw. Um, uh, but maybe it was a, a fertile environment, you know, that uh, had those kinds of uh, from a, a, a from a ecological point of view, it support supplied a broad. Um, diversity of food. Um, maybe mm. they could harvest, uh, you know, as well as hunt uh, large and small animals. Maybe they could fish from there. So, um, mm. yeah, who knows? So, like I say, mm. all these uh, evidences of uh, settled hunter gatherers all coming along at, at once. Um, yeah. Anything more you mm. want to uh, add to that? 
Uh, no, no, no. It's just, it's a lovely thing to see. You know, I mean, I say lovely. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's uh, obviously it's not a great mm -hmm. thing when you uh, you see yet more history of um, you know, f fortresses. It just smacks of of the uh, less pleasant side of uh, human nature. But um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, a protected trade route. You know, who knows? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, here <clears throat> I don't want to. Um, you know, there isn't a vast amount to say about this uh, next article, but I'm going to put this straight on the full screen, which is a closer look at the Menga yeah. Dolmen show. This is one of the greatest engineering feats of the Neolithic. And I love that uh, illustration uh, of the, you know, <laughs> I, well, they've done their homework. Um, this is an illustration. They have all that. Do you know what that looks like to me? It, it looks like the borrowers trying to move a mattress. May have to explain the borrowers, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> um, yeah, about the right right size. Uh, no. Look at the size of that. Look at the size of that piece of stone. And uh, if you want to get an impression, I think I can give it to you here. Uh, that okay. That is the um, front entrance of the Dolmen de Menga. Okay, and this is inside it so uh, thankfully that lady standing there gives a sense of scale oh this is by the way the Doma de Menga is um, uh, not far from Malaga um, on the uh, southern Spain uh, Spanish coast um, yeah uh, yeah not far from the, the sea the Mediterranean and uh, yeah that lady gives a sense of scale the 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 piece that we're actually talking about here is the piece up above uh, nearest the camera uh, in this. That is the piece that uh, must weigh, um, it is reckoned, 150 tons. Um, yes. So something like that. Uh, so this, um, what, what, what we've got here is a, a, an article that goes into the uh, detail uh, of... Oh, well, the petrology of it, where the where the stuff was quarried, how it was quarried, the different stones that go to make up uh, the um, uh, the entire. So I can, uh, in fact, I can show you uh, just to so, show how detailed the actual paper is and the trouble that they've gone to. And here's a few illustrations uh, in the actual paper itself. Uh, so rather than us delving through this, if you want to do a deep dive upon, uh, you know, how uh, the Dolmen de Mango was uh, constructed. Though it doesn't come to conclusions about the how, it, um, it's more an illustration of the incredible feat that it must have been, uh, given the size of the, uh, uh, the stone that was used and the places that uh, it came from. See, there's a a view of one of the uh, quarries there and the, and the distance and the, there you get an idea of the distance that uh, the uh, the stone came from the quarry up there top right down to uh, Dom de Manga and the Vieira Dolmen, Dom de uh, Vieira uh, which is also close by um <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I think best idea is to leave a link for people to go visit themselves uh, if they want to do a deep dive uh, on that. I'll tell you what, Rupert. Yeah. Though, uh, I'm yes. looking forward to going to uh, the Dolmen Domenga on our um, you know, uh, uh, making of Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. Well, we we need to do all the Antikythera um, Dolmen because I yeah. especially <clears> want <throat> to go to El Romoral, which is uh, one of the others yeah. in the group. Yeah. Um, yeah. For various so, reasons, which I won't bore you with now. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. talking about the Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge uh, project, uh, it is not just about uh, Gebekli Tepe. Uh, you, it's the clues in the title, uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge. So, uh, when we've uh, dealt with uh, Gebekli Tepe in early farming in Anatolia, we're going to follow the story of farming in this series of films that we're making. Uh, through up the Aegean, across the Mediterranean, up the Danube into the Balkans, and uh, across to Germany, and up the Atlantic Sea.
they built. And, of course, we'll be, have to be calling in at the Dolmen de Menga because this is one of the earliest and biggest Neolithic structures anywhere, obviously you know, created yeah. by some of the early farmers in the Mediterranean on the, on the southern Spanish coast there. Uh, it's it, it's got to be one, and talking about um, we uh, the the uh, the Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge, um, the visit that we just had uh, was pretty well uh, fully funded. We still got some bits to finish off. We still got to go to uh, the Aegean, and of course there's the whole rest of the the film uh, to make you know, visits up the Danube and, and to places like Dom, uh, the uh, Dom de Manga. And, of course, eventually we'll be coming back home to Ireland and to, and to Scotland and uh, England and, and Wales to finish off our story on the Wiltshire uh, Plains, uh, Salisbury Plains. Um, and so we're looking uh, for funding. Always, uh, Whose idea sorry, was this again? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. it's perfectly doable with the yeah. help of our our friends. We've proven it already with this first stage uh, accomplished. Uh, but of course, yeah. we're, uh, we're uh, it's an ongoing funding situation. Uh, so your any contributions you can make to the Buy Me a Coffee uh, uh, page would be absolutely uh, very welcome. As I said, uh, the link yeah. is in the description below. There's more details on the page itself and a, a sort of promotion film that you can uh, watch there. So uh, do uh, mm. click through and have a look and uh, help us complete this uh, ridiculously enormous, uh, yeah. unprecedented yeah. Uh, It, it has to be project. said that the, 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 there is, you know, there's the, the sum for each kind of leg that we do, uh, um, you know, how much we need for each leg. And, uh, and so you can, it, if you like, ignore that. Uh, because oh, yeah. because each one way. rolls into the next, and yeah. Uh, and so yeah, um, you know, it's obviously going to cost us quite a bit to get the whole thing done. So all your support is hugely appreciated. Um, yeah, yeah. Need to uh, make a few adjustments good, to the site actually uh, to reflect that. I I guess, uh, but uh, we we must put an updated. Uh, uh, Funding uh, film up as well, oughtn't we? Including yeah, some of yeah. the Quebecly Tepid stuff. Put yeah. it this way: what, what, yeah. whatever you give, it all goes to a good cause. Or however many coffees you buy, it all goes <laughs> it to uh, a very good cause mm. indeed. Anyway, uh, onward, and I think this is the very final. This is the last uh, item that we have on our list, Rupert. Would you believe? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to take us long, is it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a 25,000-year-old pyramid in Indonesia was likely not made by humans. So I don't know if this has come across your radar, folks, at any time during the, the, the past weeks, the, uh, the claim that, uh, that well, the, the hill or pyramid that you can uh, see in the picture there was, was man-made. Uh, and the claim uh, it came from a study published in uh, Archaeological Prospection, uh, and it garnered a lot of media attention, including, as IFL Science uh, confesses, um, uh, for its extraordinary claim that a mountain in Indi Indonesia is actually the world's oldest pyramid built by ancient humans. But reactions from archaeologists since have raised scepticism about its bold conclusions. Sorry about all the imagery mm. from IFL Science. Can't get rid of it. Um, according to the paper, the Gunung Padang, which translates to the Mountain of Enlightenment, was not formed naturally, but meticulously sculpted into its current shape between 25,000 and 14,000 years ago. If this were true, it would be considerably older than the world's oldest pyramids, with the team writing that it suggests that advanced construction practices were already present when agriculture had perhaps not yet been invented. Uh, other bold claims uh, include that there are hidden cavities or chambers at the site, and the site itself appeared to have been buried several times, 
possibly to conceal its true identity for preservation purposes. So the article quite rightly goes on to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and other archaeologists are far from convinced that the team has provided this, especially given how it would rewrite the history of human development. Uh, Lutfi Yondri, an archaeologist at Brin in uh, Bandung, sorry, Bandung, Indonesia told Nature that his work showed people in the area lived in caves between 12,000 and 6,000 years ago and left no evidence of having the remarkable masonry capabilities supposedly employed by people of the area thousands of years before them to build the pyramid. Flint Dibble, a name to conjure with, if you're an archaeologist. Barney Rubble's brother. Barney Rubble's brother. <laughs> Yeah, uh, an archaeologist, I mustn't laugh, an archaeologist at Cardiff University told Nature that the paper used legitimate data but made unjustified conclusions. For example, mm. yeah, and here I think in my mind and in your mind, uh, Rupert, is the absolute howler, is the team used <laughs> carbon dating, claiming that the dating of organic soils from the structures uncovered multiple construction stages dating back thousands of years BCE with the initial phase dating to the Paleolithic era. It says it in the article, so I might as well read it. It's a, it's a, they deem <coughs> the oldest part of the country dated back 27,000 years. While this may be true... Further archaeologists point out to nature that these soil samples showed no signs, such as bone fragments or charcoal, which indicate human activity. In essence, without other more compelling signs of human activity around it, all it is is evidence of old soil, yeah. which you can dig anywhere, <laughs> up anywhere, carbon date, yes. and say, oh, that's really old, <laughs> without charcoal, <laughs> without human ruins, without you know evidence of of actually direct pottery evidence that you, you cannot, it's meaningless. It is such an archaeological schoolboy howler to claim a date for something when all you've got is dirt. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, really clutching it's, at straws. It's just silly, uh, you know, the fact that all, all the archaeologists uh, were, were saying, you are just dating old soils, you've got no, you know. But... Yeah. Uh, um, no, you're right. Um, uh, Lulabelle has said uh, Flint Dibble has a funny name, but is a serious guy. Yeah. Oh, yes. Not in any way dismissing um, uh, uh, no, the no, man's no. work. No, uh, totally, totally. It's just well, it's, it... it's such a good name. And in fact, uh, you know, <laughs> look, my name's Rupert Soskin. What grief do you think I grew up with at school um, on so many levels? I envy flint dibble his name and i quite like to get him on for an interview just yeah. so that i can say that name to his face it's a fantastic name i <laughs> yeah honestly yeah. i do envy that um unforgettable uh more from him uh, later yeah but, uh, <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> yes um I mean, I don't know, Rupert. I I don't know. Is there any more to extract? Is there any? Are we missing something? Is there any uh, credit? Due? No. I mean, uh, and in you fact, know, fair you enough. Know I... It's worth investigation when you see a shape like that in the landscape. But we know that that can be uh, uh, um, from a, uh, a, a, a. I always forget the word. Um, you know, from a study of rocks point of view uh, geolo geological, geological point of view um these things can occur naturally and do and very do. frequently yeah. like the bosnian is that a lot of people still insist on saying is a, a pyramid when it's a completely natural formation mm. um but you know you, you can't stop people insisting that i mean i had somebody laughing at me only a few weeks ago uh, because they knew that the Bosnian pyramids were real, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not my place to upset other people a lot of the time, some mm. of the time, not a lot of the time. Mm. Um, but uh, it doesn't help. Oh, god, am I going to go there? Um, oh, dear. It, it, uh. it, um, it, well, it doesn't help when people like Graham Hancock 
bang on about things like this. When Graham Hancock is guilty of confirmation bias more than any researcher I have ever known. And uh, and so, you know, he put, I mean, um, he put this site in his series as evidence of his pre-Young Dryas um, civilization, And it's mm. just utter, utter nonsense. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I'll take gr- grumpy hat off. <laughs> Look, folks. <laughs> We're sorry, you know, to be such uh, damp squibs on the, on on these things. Uh, it's uh, uh, terrible, uh, you know, to to end the evening on a on a downer like that. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, um, yes, we're going to take you there. You ain't seen nothing yet. If I click on <laughs> the hyperlink of Flint Dibble here, yes. let's go. Th- I'll convert that so it's easier to. Uh, to read. I love this uh, man. Yes. So uh, this is writ- writ- written by uh, Katie Evans at uh, IFL Science uh, uh, again. And uh, this is a uh, part of this is a conversation with uh, Flint Dibble, but she heads off the article by this. She says, it's, uh, and it's called, what's it called? Oh dear. Why archaeologists are not looking for Atlantis. Okay. <laughs> She says, to put it simply, if you're looking for Atlantis, you're not an archaeologist, or not a very good one, at least. Why? <laughs> because Atlantis never existed. Yes, we know this. No, it's not a mystery. So why do people, science inclined people, inclined people inclined, uh, science inclined people included insist on searching for the mystical but crucially not mythical lost city um, mm. so there we have it folks <laughs> um, yes absolutely we have said it before I have said it myself yeah. on more than one occasion Atlantis never existed so yeah, to have yeah. Flint saying that yes Yes. So nice. Well, I, I, it says I think part of this is the idea that there's a mystery. Uh, is part of it is the idea that there's a mystery there. Archaeologist Flint Dibble told IFL Science, "There's this misconception that archaeology is about solving mysteries, when in fact we're not really doing that." I think that mystery very much romanticizes it. Mm. Okay, well, that's an interesting article to delve into at another time. But on the fact yes. that, uh, according to uh, Katie Evans, Atlantis does not exist, uh, I think on that bombshell, it is time <laughs> <laughs> to say goodbye for the evening and uh, yes. bid you all uh, a very fine time indeed. I uh, hope you have a, a great uh, rest of the week and a great weekend. Oh, and very, very happy Christmas to everybody and a happy indeed. new year. Indeed. Because uh, we won't yeah. get uh, the opportunity yeah. to speak directly to you, I don't think um, before uh, all that business is um, is over. So yeah, uh, have a good one, folks. Anything else you yeah. want to say before we part company, Rupert? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, you've been uh, you've been very lively this evening, folks. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, thanks yeah. for all the donations as well. You really do help us enormously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, uh, that's that's it for tonight, then, uh, then, then, folks. As Rupert says, uh, thanks for all, all your input. It does make it, you know, all worthwhile and feeling that it's not just a one-way street. Uh, uh, mm. And uh, yeah, you uh, inspire us and uh, and challenge us uh, all the time. So uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant stuff. As I say, this uh, will remain here as a recording on YouTube forever and a day, as long as uh, YouTube <laughs> exists. So. Uh, 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 if you missed it, you can always go back to the beginning. I think that's it. Goodbye from me. Yeah. And goodbye from me. You take good care, folks. See ya. Bye bye.